Um, if you've been here for the past hour, you've heard most of these speakers. Um, so I'm going to skip the introductions because I'm really eager to let you guys talk. But if you want to know more about them, please Google them. Everyone's, uh, everyone's Twitter is up here. Um, so let me just start with the first question. And if there are things you want to share on the introduction level, please add that. But if the panel could please describe a little bit about the place you're coming from for the people who might have not been here for the talks, and also kind of why you choose to work in the identity space. So we can all agree this is a pretty accomplished panel. They could do kind of whatever they wanted. But why are you investing your, your, your precious working years in identity? And maybe we'll just go start with Elizabeth and go over. Yeah, so for me, it's a personal pain point. So um, I've lived and worked in five countries on three different continents. Every time I've moved, I have to reestablish my identity. Um, in my personal background, I have uh, two European parents. I speak five European languages, and I cannot get a European passport because my family has no records, um, because borders have changed and things have shifted. So the tremendous friction that I've experienced in my own personal life is what drew me to the idea of self-sovereign identity when I first heard about it um, back at the MIT Media Lab last year. So um, it's, a, it's a personal passion of mine, um, and also having been a data protection privacy lawyer for the last eight plus years, I see the tremendous opportunity for us to correct the data models that exist today. So what uh, my background is in economic development and uh, financial inclusion in places like Africa and Asia. Uh, and w the reason why I came to the identity space is because there are 1.7 billion financially excluded um, and identity is one of the biggest barriers to financial inclusion um, because of KYC um, regulations and so forth. So that's why I'm here. Uh, this is really good. Um, I went to school to uh, become an economist, and halfway through trying to become an economist, I fell into technology. And I spent a great deal of time building technology companies and making small fortunes for venture capitalists that didn't need money. So uh, four years ago, I founded a company that was about using the distributed ledger for healthcare and healthcare records. And two years ago, two and a half years ago, I founded this company, pivoting away from the problem of healthcare to the larger problem of identity. Healthcare just scratches the surface of identity. It goes so far down, all the way down to uh, every individual person and how they lead their life. So I got into identity to solve a couple of major problems that are near and dear to my heart. Um, the financial inequality that I was speaking of earlier and the cost of capital in the frontier markets hits a lot of my friends. I went to a graduate school that's 70% international students. I've maintained all those relationships and I see how their lives are playing out and it personally impacts me. That's how I got here. Cool. Um, I've been working on identity my entire professional career, basically, and um, I got started after um, connecting to a network called Planet Work. And they were a community who had done some introspection about how, how could the internet and the emerging web at the time in the late 1990s um, serve people on the planet better. And they identified a critical missing gap, which was user-centric digital identity. How do people own and control their own identities and they, they even wrote a paper called The Augmented Social Network, Building Identity and Trust into the Next Generation Internet. And they said, if we don't get user-centric digital identity based on open standards, giant corporations and governments will own all our identities. And lo and behold, 15 years later, that prediction is right, except we've been continuing to convene and gather to try to solve this challenge. And I think we're on the cusp of these new distributed ledger technologies and the open standards around them, providing a way for people to own and control their own digital identities and support all the communities of people connecting to the, in a peer-to-peer -peer way, not being intermediated by entities like Facebook or other centralized social networks, but by our own, owned and managed by ourselves yeah. in our own communities. So it's very exciting. So one of the reasons we wrote this paper is because when you talk to these folks, 
you're both excited by what they're talking about, and at least I am generally confused by the very elaborate terms that are used. And then people are talking about self-sovereign identity, and then they suddenly say user-centric identity, and then they throw in federated identity, and I'm, my head just hurts. So what we try to do in this paper is, is make sure we, we walk through these things and explain some of these terms. And, and I want to be clear, digital identity could be centralized identity. You know, people use federated and user-centric identity a little bit interchangeably when they talk about Google and not, and there's nuance there. But we're talking about self-sovereign identity. We're talking about identity where you, the user, owns and controls your data. It does not sit on someone else's database. You and only you can turn it off. And, and, and I chose to focus my paper on that, both because it's the fuzziest and most confusing, but also because the, the work of digital identity has, has been handled by others. So I want to point out um, the Center for Global Development wrote this incredible book by um, Alan Gelb and Anna Diafazi Metz. And it's an incredible walk through digital identity. So that, that's a whole thing. And we're not talking about that. I'm not tackling that whole thing. That's been done. Um, we're talking about self-sovereign identity, this idea that it would be controlled by the user. So the question to the panel is, with that clarification, when is this going to stop being theoretical? When is this going to actually happen in the field? When are lives going to be touched? When are people, everybody likes to sort of almost fetishize the bottom million, we're going to help the poor people one day. Like, when is that going to happen? And when is this going to be real? And if there are pilots going on, this is one I'd love to hear about. Them. Um, Brad, you want to start? Sure. Um, so rubber is meeting the road this year. Um, we've announced a couple of um, significant partnerships with sovereign governments. Uh, we'll be distributing liquid uh, propane gas for the government of Indonesia inside of their TNP2K, which is their poverty reduction division of the office of the vice president. The pilot will involve 6,000 individuals uh, who are receiving this aid, and that'll be happening later this year. Also, we've announced the Cambodian government, the central province, is going to be using EverID to track healthcare and to track uh, neonatal disbursements of uh, foodstuffs uh, and vitamins uh, for mothers and post uh, birth for the first year of the child's life. So, the, yeah, so that, thank you for those examples. The tipping point, when, it was, when is this going to go from pilots to? Oh, uh, when we succeed. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, pilots generally uh, in technology are proof points. And governments like proof points. Fair point. <laughs> Elizabeth? I think there's, um, there are two things that are happening simultaneously right now that will tip the scales. I think the first is the technology coming a long way, uh, the mobile device becoming near ubiquitous and having sort of the capabilities that we need to manage the kind of wallets that we need and to have the, the um, autonomous agent capabilities of, uh, of managing your connections and your data. Um, I think that coupled with changing attitudes, although they're still painfully slow to change, around the threats posed by GAFA and these large intermediaries. Um, I think those two things coming together, you know, we still don't have enough pain. I think we still need more pain. Um, I think, you know, you've seen other countries, these delete Facebook days, and you've seen some backlash. And, you, and I'm very active in, in working with governments around the world, and you see a lot of governments very aggressively tackling this. We don't have nearly enough pain right now, I think, here to appreciate the gravity of the situation. I don't think we have enough transparency and understanding of the risks. Um, so I think the technology coming along in tandem with the policy work that you know, we're trying to do, particularly at Evernim, we're very focused on this policy engineering aspect um, to illuminate kind of the, the scale of the problem have to happen together. Otherwise, our concern in the self-sovereign identity community, of course, is that a Google or a Facebook will come and do this first um, and that we'll have the same trust problems that we've had all along. Um, from our perspective, if you want a concrete example, we're very close to uh, production level uh, rollout with um, a credit union consortium of basically creating a new digital credential that will be portable across the credit union, union industry and globally as well. Um, and that's a really interesting area because 
cre credit unions traditionally have been able to be a little bit more innovative than banks um, just because of their regulatory environments. And a lot of people in this panel have mentioned financial inclusion. And so these kind of alternative sources of, um, of credentials and identity are really interesting to us. Um, and then, of course, I think you'll probably mention it later, but we've also got some work going on with iRespond that's um, pretty much live. So, uh, so I think that we're, we need to be more focused on the policy work. I, I think there's been a lot of emphasis on technology and not enough emphasis on the law and the policy. And I think the real catalyst is going to be from uh, the shifting attitudes there. Jim? Yeah, um, so I agree uh, that we're, we're getting closer to the tipping point. Um, you're starting to see policy converge with um, you know, the, the technology. There's definitely more participation in um, the open source, open standards conversations. And, um, but I think we st until we have um, acceptance for your daily transactions, like right now, I can't go to a liquor store and show my Facebook or LinkedIn profile and, you know, they'll give me. <laughs> it's just until we see that happening, you have not reached the general population. And I think we're a ways off on that with self-sovereign identity. It's going to take a lot of hard work. It's going to require adoption by government. And um, I think they are going to, banks and governments are the ones Credit unions, I think, are a fantastic, um, you know, driver of, of getting this. And, and we don't have enough friction here in the U.S., like Elizabeth was saying, or even in the EU. I think GDPR is helping push some of this. Um, but I think, um, you know, in places where there is so much exclusion and the policy is so far behind, you'll see the leapfrogging of this technology where they're ju it's just going to happen. One of the, the leading uh, early adopters in this space is actually government. The province of British Columbia has been actively building tools for their citizens and also for their different government agencies. And they're looking at this year are rolling out uh, the issuance of verifiable credentials to businesses who are chartered with the province along with the licensing that whatever licensing they have at the provincial level so that the businesses now will have digital versions of all those credentials and can use them to interact with other governments like the government of Canada without having to fax around a bunch of paper. So it's, there's, there's signs, like this year you will see things actually out in the field. And that gets to the point of registries, right? So what the, that, what the BC government did, and this, that's also mentioned in our paper, is, is have a registry of companies and that was a centralized data registry where they said, hey, company, here we've gone ahead and taken this data. I'm using broad strokes here. You know, we've taken your data. We've packaged it up. Come and claim it and move it into a digital wallet for your company. So that's this idea of self-sovereign identity applied to organizations. Um, and, but the way I think about it is the identity is, is how a registry starts to wrestle with and understand what self-sovereign identity means for the, for the future. And that's, and I'm not asking you to all be like, yes, Mike, you were right. But, What's, what's your thought on this idea of bringing registries in? Because as a property rights guy, the fact that I'm mentioning registries is almost like, of course, you're, it's all property rights people do. So I mean, w when I've said this to you, any thoughts or how, how your platform would think about its interaction with registries, which I think also gets to the, a lot of what you said, Shaley, of government's future role. In fact, you want to? Well, yeah. Um, you know, actually, we, we, are, uh, we just recently launched 3Box. Um, at Consensus, which is leveraging Uport, and it's, um, I'm reading something here because this is very new, um, open source data storage solution for uh, Web 3.0 that allows users to manage private and public information on decentralized web. The, so the data, there's a registry on IPFS, which is the interplanetary filing system, and it's managed by the Orbit DB. So we, I think registries are critical um, to the adoption. Yeah, um, so I think there is a little bit of a misconception with self-sovereign identity that it means that we're doing away with all the conventional roots of trust, so government, central banks, you know, universities. Um, it's quite the opposite, actually. Uh, what it does is self-sovereign identity really enhances those existing sources of authority and roots of trust um, and brings them into the 21st century. Uh, so registries are incredibly important. I think those of you who are familiar with blockchain may have heard of something called an oracle or an oracle function basically takes things that exist in the real world, real, real world 
excuse me, real world assets and um, translates them into what's recorded on a ledger uh, or a blockchain. And so, of course, we have the problem of garbage in, garbage out. So registries are incredibly important, especially in the property context. If you have um, valid and uh, legitimate and uh, accurate registries that exist in the real world, being able to digitize those and leverage blockchain to kind of enhance the um, verification uh, capabilities is really an incredible uh, improvement, enhancement, and allows that direct accessibility so that you don't have to go through the land registry office or various you know, bureaucratic agencies that might be very slow um, and particularly in certain you know, geographies and areas where um, some of those institutions are lacking trust and are lacking transparency, transparency and accessibility, um, a voting registry is a really good example. Right? So we think about it maybe with, we're thinking about real property or land rights, but if you think about other registries that are incredibly important to make more accessible and more transparent uh, to individuals um, in a lot of critical places with vulnerable populations, um, there's tremendous value there. Um, the other thing I would say, though, is I would caution against, so as a lawyer, I worry about the presumption of, you know, if something isn't documented, it means it doesn't exist. Uh, I think we have to be very careful about that in the blockchain space. We have to be very careful about the fact that um, registries are not perfect, right? They're created by humans. There are a lot of flaws. And then further baking those flaws into an immutable record uh, is a very dangerous proposition. So uh, we need to be mindful and, and sometimes slower than we'd like to be and cautious about that. Um, I don't want to live in a world where if something isn't on a ledger, it means it doesn't exist. And I think that's particularly important from a human rights perspective and intrinsic rights that don't require a deed or a title, you know, that, are, that, are, that exist independent of that record. Uh, so that's the only caution I would add to it. Brad, go ahead. Uh, I would echo Elizabeth on this. I, I believe that the registries that exist today are critically important for us to leverage in a self-sovereign identity space. The institutional attestations and community attestations I was referring to earlier are exactly that. Um, in Bangladesh, as an example, the community attestation matrix that they use to distribute funds to school-age children has absolutely no root in any identity other than other parents of students vouching that you're you. And they sent hundreds of millions of dollars through that capacity just based on the community web of trust. Thanks. Clay, you've, you've already opined on registries. Yeah, I mean, yeah. registries are important. And the conversations with governments about how they leverage these new technologies to do what they're already doing, but in a more efficient way that's more empowering to their citizens is, is really happening. Um, and I think it's, it's not just how they leverage SSI, but how the existence of FS, SSI sort of forces them to evolve. Yeah. Right? Registries need to, if you think about what a registry does, and we, make this, we belabor this point in the paper, step one is validate that you're you. When you walk in and you want your name tied to your car, show me your driver's license, confirm your identity. If, if there's a functioning SSI system, what does that change? So Elizabeth mentioned I respond, and I want to digress, and you saw me f fumbling with my papers. That's because in the past six months of writing this paper, I've both everybody has said to me, okay, so we're doing this really cool thing, but I don't know if you could talk about it yet. <laughs> Brad and his co-founder Bob were particularly bad at that, but, but I respond um, really hammered the point home. Um, but in the paper, I was just checking that we were allowed to publish this. In, there, are case, there are brief case studies in East Africa, Myanmar, and Thailand, where they were using this for health records and for human trafficking. And um, you're probably thinking, wait, who's I respond? Why aren't they on stage? So I respond as a biometric service provider that is out in the field working hard to bring digital identity, uh, self-sovereign identity to lots of populations. And I just want to share one exceptionally cool example that I respond mentioned to me. And he was like, um, the gentleman's name is Peter, he's the CEO of I respond. And he said, you know, HIV vaccine studies are happening right now in East Africa. And if you're an enterprising young East African, if you're anybody anywhere and someone's paying you an incentive, you're going to want all the incentives you can get. So if there's three vaccine studies, sign me up. I'll take a $50 Amazon card from every registry, right? The trouble is, if you have three HIV vaccines in your blood, we don't know which one worked. So I desperately need to do as many studies as I can as fast as possible on these vaccines and pick a country. But once you've signed up for one, I, it's not okay for you to sign up for any others. And how do I do that if, if you want the money because there's people to feed? So the way they do that is they take the biometry, the raw biometry, they put it in a template, they hash it, and they list it in an anonymized shared directory between these different HIV studies, HIV vaccine studies. And then once you go to enroll, you do an iris scan, they check it, 
And if it's already in there, it's anonymized. It's just a hash of the, of the template. Sorry, you can't enroll in this study. You've already been enrolled in this study. So that's just one example of like an innovative use of the technology we're talking about in the developing world. Um, but what we're talking about here with East Africa, Myanmar, and Thailand is how iRespond has been um, using biometry and self sovereign identity solutions to deliver aid in the manner which um, Brad alluded to. But back to the question, I still don't know who iRespond is. So iRespond is, um, is a biometry provider that works on the sovereign, works with sovereign. Um, and, that, and then you were asking the question, and this is one of the things we try to elucidate in the paper. What's the difference? Like, Brad, they're all, they're all doing self sovereign identity, right? So I can use them all. And, and I've taken the liberty of, of describing the difference this way. If you think about it, I was, I was driving here today and I saw one of these scooters and it had on the bottom those, you know, those two logos we all see? Apple Store, Google Play Store, download the app, right? For these two platforms. But if you think about it, the Google is a big, wide Android platform that you can use a Moto phone, an Android phone, a Pixel phone, whatever you want. But it's a, it's a huge platform that you can build different things on. Whereas Apple is an integrated wall garden where all things have an Apple logo on them. And that is how I, with my clumsy, non-technical, probably wrong perspective, think about Everest, Everest, and Evernim. At least you could have chosen names that didn't start with the same letter, right? <laughs> so I think of Everest as an Apple solution. They are an integrated, fully baked, you walk into the Everest thing and there's Everest everything to meet your needs, including biometry. It's really fun to talk to Brad about biometry and talk to Peter about biometry. Those conversations go on forever. Whereas Evernim is trying to build this one massive platform that everybody can build different things on. And I thought incorrectly that iRespond was working on that, but then I, I introduced iRespond to Brad thinking I would get a good debate out of it, and they ended up agreeing to maybe work together because they can also use their biometry solution. So there's a lot of really exciting stuff, but I think thinking about the difference between these players, the Apple model for Everest, the Google model for Evernim, and then what is, what's Uport doing? Well, Uport's inside of this whole other thinking about it. consensus. <laughs> no, I mean, there's this whole consensus <laughs> ecosystem. So once you dive into the blockchain world, and you get into the DApp world, and I realize for some people I'm speaking a foreign language, and I apologize. Then you need an identity inside that space, and could that identify port out? So this, it, and we're in the very beginning of a tidal wave, the very beginning. And I, I'm not saying anyone's going to win. I don't, at the end of this paper, be like, I love Evernim the most. I don't say that. I, I say that these, I, I'm sh I wouldn't be surprised if, I, if one day we saw identify yourself with Evernim or with Everest. It wouldn't blow my, or with Uport. You know, I wouldn't blow my mind. Um, and that gets us to the, to the more exciting part of this panel, where we start talking about the differences of, of how these, these things work. Um, so one of the differences that comes up in conversation a lot is open standards versus open source. And I'm just taking us right to the, to the good stuff here. Um, can you talk about the difference between open standards and open source, Elizabeth, and why you guys do what you do? Sure. Um, so we have the open, open, open approach, uh, which is open standards, open source code, and open governance. And I alluded to some of this in my presentation. Um, we think that without all three, uh, we don't have a sustainable, interoperable solution for, for cross-border um, identity management. So the open standards bit, uh, Kalia covered really well in her presentation around um, the core of it is the DID, or the, the, the decentralized identifier. Um, so Evernim and the Sovereign Foundation have been very active, along with Kali and others, in um, the W3C and um, the DIF as well, which Shaley mentioned, um, in building out these open standards for effectively how do we speak the same language around our decentralized identity management. Um, so the DID is, is, as I said, the core of that. Um, but there, and so there are various DID methods. There's a you know, Uport method. Um, there's the Sovereign method. There's a, um, a Bitcoin method. There are various kinds. Um, but we want them to ultimately be interoperable because we don't believe in a walled garden approach. We believe in this open, open, open approach. The second piece is that open source code, as I mentioned. So everything that we're doing is built on Hyperledger Indy, which is part of the Linux, Linux Foundation, which is um, basically, as I mentioned, the Apache 2 license, um, with a few exceptions there. Uh, so that's all uh, open and transparent and auditable. Um, and the third piece, which is really important, which I think a lot of projects are losing sight of, is open governance. So as I mentioned, we have a, uh, a public, uh, fully transparent, auditable governance framework, uh, formerly, formerly called a trust framework, but now a governance framework, 
um, which outlines all of our policies and procedures and processes for changing everything from a technical standard to um, uh, design of the network to st how stewards uh, are qualified to participate in the consensus uh, protocol and validate transactions on the ledger. Um, so everything is, is out there for everyone to see and inspect. Um, and so I, we really feel that without, as I mentioned, the, the, all three elements, uh, you don't have a fully uh, sustainable solution. Thank you. Brad, how about Everett? Um, I was very well put. Uh, I would characterize our approach um, as the Apple approach. Apple is an openly proprietary system manufacturer. They take open source tools and create a proprietary tack, uh, stack of those open source tools. In a very similar way, we take open source tools, make a proprietary stack, and deliver that stack. The uh, open standards are important. Open source, we are uh, less religious about because of some of our experiences in the open source community. Uh, for four and a half years, I sat next to Bram Cohen, the creator of BitTorrent. And I've had many, many conversations with Bram, some of them centering around, why did you put this in the open source? And he has a very standard response. It was in fashion at the time. In 2003, that's what you did to become a cool coder. You put your thing into the open source community. I would bet that all of Hollywood and all of Nashville would argue that this was probably a bad move. Okay? It cratered two entire industries. That's just the facts. So that open source, probably not a great move. Um, Similarly, Apple, with Fairplay, takes a proprietary stack of open source tools, wraps everything in iTunes in Fairplay, and sells it to you. Why do they not open source Fairplay? Because knowing the recipe allows you to attack it. Once you understand the recipe, it's a vector of attack. I can just sit here and hammer on this one thing until I figure it out. If you obscure the fact that your recipe involves these 75 steps, it's much harder to attack. So for that simple reason, there are components inside of our system that will never be open source. Other components will be open source, and some components will be derived from open source communities which we will be providing back any enhancements to as good members of those communities. And can you also talk about DIDs? Sure. Um, so DIDs uh, are quite important. There are multiple competing uh, standards around this. We are based on a private permissioned Ethereum blockchain, which means we are not open on mainnet. We are operating our own thing. The INF that I was alluding to earlier is the actual operator of that underlying blockchain. Uh, inside of Ethereum, there are known as Ethereum Improvement Projects, EIP. EIP 725 and 735 are a claims registry and a claims management system. So while the IDs that are being uh, standardized by the W3C and some of these other organizations exist, doesn't necessarily fit directly into my world because we're built on Ethereum and there's already a solution natively there. Okay. Yeah, I would, we use the similar standard, the ERC EIP 725. Um, this is our proposed identity standard. Um, the way we feel about open source, amazing. We love it. Open source is great. Um, open standards, we are all for it. And I, I think we're trying to learn from the previous attempts of um, you know, the ITU's uh, identity standards and then open ID from enterprise ID uh, for, for enterprise IDs. And, and, but we can't wait. So in the meantime, we are going to move forward with the ERC 725 and just continue to learn. <laughs> so, so we're both cringing. Not, we're so, both so making. Had, what's your perspective on? Uh, so the, I just want to say, like, Uport isn't e ERC seven twenty five. No. In fact, the Uport team has written a very clear distinction between their entire stack and how it's quite different than ERC seven twenty five. Thank you. I don't work for Uport. I work for Consensus. I'm supposed to be. <laughs> Thank you so much <laughs> for clarifying that. Yeah. But, 
this is the, this is the fun <laughs> stuff. This is why writing this paper was so much fun, right? Because you talk to Kalia, and there's an impassioned plea that open standards are the way, the truth, and the light, and without them, we will not be saved. And then you talk to Brad, and he says this, you know, he tells a great story about BitTorrent. And, and what's important to understand is, what we do believe the future is coming, and we, yeah. have, and we have heard that governments are starting to do proofs of concept. These ships are, these, these, these things, the reality the is. The ships are being built as they're starting to sail across the ocean. And, and that's the, yeah. really ships. true. And I think, um, I think that um, different, different projects are starting in different places, right? So uh, Brad's company's choices are informed by the market that he's going into first. The choices to center around open standards specifically for interoperable, verifiable credentials, is really rooted in companies looking at developed world contexts with significant existing registry systems that are functioning using paper. And the question is, how do you transfer those multitude of different credentials that individuals carry in their wallet and have on their walls from universities, from governments, all sorts of places, how do they collect those up in a digitally native form that's trustable by other folks when they present that. And those are two really different problems. And to solve that problem of multiple credentials from multiple sources, a really good way to get to interoperability really fast is to have open standards so that a verifiable credential is a verifiable credential. And it's easy to read and store in whichever wallet you choose, whether it's a Veris One one or a one produced by the company Evernim, or one produced by a different company also working in the sovereign network, or one produced by Uport, right? Like, that I should be able to collect my verifiable credentials from wherever they come from using whatever software and store them in any wallet that accepts these open standards-based credentials and then present them, right? So that you're building a complex ecosystem of service providers who are all able to speak the same language <coughs> even if they're using different code underneath. And, and I think for us to have this paradigm shift to move what into, is truly self-sovereign identity has to be vendor agnostic. So we want to build it so that if we go away, your, your identifiers don't go away. And they're not now useless and your credentials are still you know, accepted elsewhere. So I think that's the problem with the wall garden approach is that um, it, there is that vendor dependency. And that really isn't any different from the way it is now. So I, I really, uh, that's why I think Kalia and I are so passionate about this. Um, is, is we want to flip the paradigm. We want to take the vendor out of the center. We want to put the individual in the center. And that means that they have to be able to, to take that anywhere that they want to and, and, and you know, for, for a long time as well, not because someone's around. So you know, again, ideally, if we go away, it doesn't change anything. You can still go and use your credentials and your dids, and um, they'll be accepted and, and you know, the com they'll be compatible with other wallets and other agents and, and other pieces of technology as well. Brad, do you want to? Um. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to get this into no, a no, no, no. fist fight, but I, I just want. There's <laughs> there is an important distinction to make here, and 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 you're prodding me at the exact right moment. So, um, there's a significant difference between a federated model and a concentrated model. Uh, Everest and EverID is a concentrated model. We take in all claims and we write them to a central datagram that you carry around with you. That datagram contains all of your claims. I don't have to go out back to my bank and say, am I really me? I don't have to go back to a government server and say, am I really me? And more importantly, if my insurance company goes out of business and that server is no longer powered, what happened to my claim? If my bank gets bought by another bank and the bank that did the acquisition didn't decide that they liked the service and turned off the server, what happened to my claim? Uh, I think it's much better for us to concentrate all of that information and allow the user control over that information. So that's a little bit of a difference between the way that Evernim sees the world and the way that Everest sees the world. Concentrated concentrated in central. Right. Concentrated in the Exactly. <laughs> it depends. It depends. Um, there's a lot more nuance there, and there's a lot more. So one of the things that we worry about is um, centralization by decentralization. So we don't want a decentralized source of truth to now be the central point of failure, right? So there, there still has to be this sort of um, multi-source, uh, complex, layered approach. 
um, because you can have, you know, if you have a, a full dependency on one ledger or on one provider on one wallet, then you'd have the same problems that we have now. So I think there's just that, the consciousness of, but then again, it's all very early days, so we don't, <laughs> we don't actually know what the best approach will be, but I think it's a healthy debate to have. Nope. <laughs> I'm still learning. <laughs> I just started recently. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is the magic of this, right? <laughs> Facebook so when you peel the onion and you look at what Brad's been coding for years and you look at what Elizabeth just explained to Parliament and you look at what Shaley's working on, which is part of a much bigger who does land rights in the field using tax. If they were to go forward and do something, which platform would they use? And that what we attempt to do in this paper, because again, I'm always selling my latest work, which is free, by the way. I'm just I'm selling it. Um, <laughs> what we try to do in this paper is give you, the, the, the uninitiated, a way to start thinking about just the questions you would ask if you walked into the room with any of them, as well as, uh, could we have dropped some names in there, Barris one, Moody, um, there are other people in this place who, there's a lot of people who say they do self-sovereign identity. And because so for some it's a catchy term. And maybe they do self-sovereign identity, maybe they actually do KYC. Depends. So, but that's just a glimpse into some of the internal controversies here. So let's take us to one of the external controversies. One of my favorite papers that the World Bank has recently written is an assessment of biometric platforms in the world. And they very nobly created a framework. They have a great circle saying, you know, here are the different things you need to think about with biometry, and let's go through each of these platforms. And then we're going to red, yellow, green the different slices of these pies. And I joke, it's the yellow circle paper. Because <laughs> even though they wanted to red, yellow, green everything, basically everything in that paper is yellow. Right? It's a big, I don't know, we'll see. Um, but and I mentioned this a little bit, but I respond. But <coughs> if, 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 if you guys could all talk quickly about biometry, both as it's used um, on device and across your ecosystem. And maybe Brad, do you want to kick this one off? Sure. Um, so inside of EverID, there are currently two forms of biometry. We built a backplane which allows us to plug in additional forms of biometry. Why did we do that? Because we are concerned about the commercially applicable biometry uh, scanners that are out there. What is commercially viable today? Is a $4,000 iris scanner, really a great entry point for giving aid to refugees? Probably not. Uh, is a $250 smartphone? That's a little bit better, a little cheaper, a little easier to deal with. Uh, in the future, are we going to plug in alternate forms of identity? Certainly. One of the most exciting that I find is the intersinus rhythm between the P and the S waves in a heartbeat. <coughs> That's actually four times more specific than a fingerprint. Okay? The Apple Watch 4 reads that. So we're on the cusp of seeing a new form of biometry come into the marketplace. That's why we built a backplane so that we can plug everything in. Um, as Mike was saying at the beginning, there's all these challenges of biometry in the field. Um, I've spoken at length with some of the folks that are currently deploying uh, iris scanning ATMs in Syria. And one of the gentlemen was sharing with me that he tried unsuccessfully for more than 30 minutes to enroll a lady at an ATM. And the problem is <coughs> dust. It's not something they had factored into their thinking. So there's constantly not only dust in the air, but dust on the lens and dust in the camera. Okay, So you got problems. Um, the reason we start with biometry and build up all of these attestations around biometry is that's the only way to make sure that an individual is an individual and is not creating civil attacks into a system. <coughs> if I know that you're you and you are only you, I can give you an identity and start to do really interesting things. Um, Kalia was alluding to the fact that we're starting in the frontier world, and that is exactly where we're starting for this exact reason. If you're a refugee getting off a boat or walking out of the water, what identity do you have? You have yourself. That's it. 
In security, there are three silos. What you have, who you are, what you know. In biometry, the first two collapse. Now you have who I am and what I know. So inside of our system, we have a biometry check and a PIN check, or a biometry check and a password check. Always the two. Um, surveillance systems, like the one that is currently operated in London, doesn't have the second piece. They are not getting consent from the user to take their biometry. That's in essence what the PIN or the password is in our system. It's a consent metric. I've scanned you, but are you allowing me to use your biometry? Ah, you gave me your PIN, you are. Okay? That's a critical component for all of this. The user has to be in control and has to be giving assent positively to the use of their biometry. Elizabeth? Uh, so consent is interesting. I, I don't think I don't think you have legitimate consent if you don't have choice or you're locked out of a service or you, you know, um, so I, I think there's a lot to unpack in there. I think in terms of biometrics, the, the reason we need them right now is um, so much of what we're building is dependent on the mobile device. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we need to connect something in the real world to something digitized. And so right now, um, the only way that we can really prove control of a device is the use of a biometric. So, you know, you know thumbprint or face scan. Um, it's so far from perfect, uh, but it's really all that we have right now. In, um, if we're going to use mobile device-based wallets and agents to mediate these digital identifiers and, and the exchange of credentials for us, we have to have some way of proving ownership of the device. Uh, so it's really inadequate and it's really imperfect, but it's really the best that we have right now. And we want it, we all, I think, in, in the industry are worried about the shortcomings there. And, we know how imperfect they are. So another population that's really interesting to me are they tried to do um, thumbprints, uh, I think, with surfers in the south of Portugal. And basically, their fingerprints have eroded from what they do for, for a living. So, uh, so there are a lot of imperfections. Yes, the iris scan as well. Um, so the industry, I guess the good news is, is that we're aware and we're worried about the shortcomings and we're trying to solve for them. Um, but we're also, as Shaylee mentioned, we, we're, we're not we don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good, and now that's super high risk in certain populations. So this is where I go back to, you need a governance framework. You can't rely upon the technology vendor and what they tell you about the technology. They, there needs to be a publicly auditable governance framework that governments and policymakers and regulators can look at and can understand what are the assumptions baked into the use of these technologies? How are they deployed? What are the protections for individuals if something goes wrong? What is the dispute mechanism? Uh, there has to be that, that piece of it. And that's the part that I just see overlooked time and time again in this industry, is the overemphasis on the technology and the underemphasis on, on the governance. Um, so I, I think, you know, especially in, in DC and this audience, a lot of policymakers and regulators around, um, that's part of the struggle with the industry is um, we haven't been addressing those concerns nearly enough. Um, it, it, you know, from my perspective, it should be really prominent. Um, so, Again, biometrics kind of where we are today, but if we think about the results we want to achieve and, and the policy ends and objectives, um, we should just think about biometrics as a tool and not as you know, having any inherent value. It, it's about that fungibility problem of uh, how do I know? It's the double spend problem of the human, right? This is why blockchain identity are interesting because blockchain is fundamentally, a, it, it, it's solving that double spend problem of this asset hasn't been allocated before. So if you think about your identity as a digital asset that has someone is someone else trying to use your identity, or someone already used that identity. That's the core. That's the core of why these two make sense together. But you can't you can't, you can't really extend it beyond that. You have to be mindful of the the context of rights, fundamental rights, civil rights, human rights around that. And that's why the governance piece is really critical because the technology can solve that that asset management piece. It can't solve everything else of who we are and what we have, and as Brad mentioned, what you bring and what you know. Um, so I, I I think that has to be core. Shaley Clea, I think. I agree on the governance framework. Um, we are, it, you know, consensus is kind of in the midst of, or at the beginning of creating a government stack, and identity is critical to that government stack. And so, um, you know, the governance of identity, I love what Sovereign Trust Framework has done in being inclusive of, even in the development stages of that framework. Um, and so, I, we have a long way to go in actually implementing this framework and, and in systems, um, but 
we're at a starting point and on the biometrics, I have the official Slack message from Reuven that biometrics are good for better protecting access to devices like smartphones. But um, you know, we're still, there's still imperfections in um, the use of biometrics and, but they're the best that we have right now, but that there's still a lot of challenges there. There was a paper that was written um, uh, probably six months ago and I, they were just pushing to get to the final draft. Um, six principles for biometrics use in self-sovereign identity. And I think one of the most exciting things is that I can actually potentially store my own biometrics in my own personal cloud, and then I can authenticate to myself, right? So that I can show up and say, I've enrolled my biometrics, some entity you might you know, have confidence in um, to have that happen has signed it, but you actually don't need to see it and neither does the entity that enrolled it. I store my own biometrics and I can authenticate against my own data store and assert my identity without it landing in a centralized database. And I actually think um, we need to broaden the conversation and get into the nitty gritty of how these systems and work with unlikely partners in figuring out how they should work and you know, even going to like actually engaging with religious leaders. And religious minorities have been at the affect of really bad systems for a while. And in fact, there's a whole book called IBM and the Holocaust about how IBM's technologies enabled what happened in Nazi Germany to happen. And we have to get out in front of this and think, how are we actually building a system so bad stuff can't happen to at-risk groups? And do that now, not in 20, 25 years after they've been abused and used in really bad ways. Yeah, well, one of the, one of the articles I read in writing this paper, I just sort of put, my, put it down, and I, I'll go for a walk afterwards, was this horrible Wired article about the Rohingya, right? So in, in uh, Bangladesh, they've been using biometry to do food distribution in the camps, and then the winds have changed, and the Bangladeshis now want to send the Rohingya back to Myanmar, complete with their biometric profiles. You don't need to stop and think more than two seconds about how disturbing that is. Um, so I think just, again, to bring it up a few levels, biometry is, a, as a, as a, if we just think about the basic idea of a username and a password, there are times when our biometry is our username, and there's times where our biometry is our password, right? And it's, it's important to think about, like on, our, on my device, my fingerprint is what gets me into my device, there's my password. But for some of these platforms, we're talking about biometry as the base for your identity. And so what does it mean and how do you spoof it? And that this, this, we could go on for hours. But I want to get to questions. Brad, I didn't give you a chance. Any, I, um, so I do want to make one, one and then Tim, minor clarification. Um, to Kalia's point, it's very important that the user is able to enroll themselves and is storing their information in a locker under their control. In our system, the locker is provided to the user when they enroll. Um, the user's biometry uh, inside of the EverID platform in Everest is resident in the platform, not on the device, which is a very big difference. So we can address the people without a smartphone. We can address the people without technology at all by being able to have the user assent, assent to allowing their biometry to be used. Right, which is, I don't, I think, Correct me if I'm wrong. Currently not true with Uport, right? You need a device to have a, right? And, and with Sovereign, you can do either. Okay, so again, this fascinating spectrum. Okay, so I hope there are some questions. If there aren't, I can keep this going all day long. But if you have questions, please raise your hand and the mic is in the back. And start over here and just go over. Hi. It's on. Hi, uh, Rory McMillan. Um, I'm interested in, in uh, where you started, which is how do we get to scale? Yep. Uh, how, do, how do we get a tipping point shifting? And it strikes me that, Brad, you, you guys are going after government, and that seems like a very obvious kind of way to go after scale. I'm thinking of how uh, India's Adhar scheme grew at huge pace. We're, we're doing work with the World Bank on the ID4D uh, 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 initiative they have. Um, one of the things that gives me nightmares is the centralized sort of approach uh, uh, around some of that. Um, the nightmares are my dreams. I don't know whether they're real. Um, what, I, what I'm really interested in is uh, whether when you um, uh, 
are, are, are looking to scale is the way in here for you effectively to be almost kind of like an outsource, almost a procurement part of a centralized government system where you then build on the back of that your client relationships with the individuals who are building their, 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 their data in your, in your systems, after which you're then able to take that elsewhere. If, if that's the model, and you, you know, correct me if I'm, if I'm getting it wrong, um, if that's the model, what in, in terms of infrastructure, policy, and particularly legal, and I think this, this comes to your point, Elizabeth, what's needed um, to make that really uh, uh, possible to, to scale out um, so that enough people will trust and uh, go with your brand, um, put themselves into the system, and then it'll be interoperable elsewhere. What sort of laws do we, I'm a lawyer, what kind of laws do we need to get governments to adopt so that this sort of thing can, can, can scale up as opposed to us falling back each time to a government initiated, budgeted, procured, controlled system, which is in some cases fine, but we were looking at a case in Somalia recently and I don't know which faction of the government would be in charge of that. Right. You know, so can you just, Certainly. Comment on that, please. Uh, An excellent question. The um, market addressing is the first part of your question, which is how do we address the market? We're a B two B two C company. We make a community management platform. Okay, mm -hmm. we partner with governments or non-governmental organizations that have large communities that they need to manage and send value to. Um, almost any entity that you can think of needs to understand who they're sending the value to and needs to account for the value sent. Uh, it is critical in a lot of non-governmental organizations to show the custody of the disbursement all the way down to the individual so that they can turn back to their donors and say, look, 97% of the dollars you gave us arrived at these individuals and helped them. Okay? That's a critical component. So, we partner with large organizations that have communities that they need to manage. The two examples that I threw out earlier were uh, the sovereign governments that we've announced, but we're working with non-governmental organizations to manage their communities as well. Um, the second component of that was what laws do we need to put in place to make sure that this is safe for the individual? And uh, Somalia is a great example. Uh, there's a lot of flux in Somalia. There is a lot of change, and it is very rapid, and it's not always positive. Uh, and you start to get to the point of uh, individuals within the country not trusting certain factions of the government, and that rolling up to a sentiment of not trusting the government at all. Uh, as a non-governmental organization and a non-profit foundation, the Identity Network Foundation is actually engineered to sit and straddle over non-governmental organizations and governmental organizations to provide an extra governmental identity system. Okay? And that's important, especially when you talk about migration or the refugee crisis. Uh, the government that holds your held your identity when you left the country that you left probably isn't providing that to the country that you arrived at. Um, an example in Indonesia that um, cuts me very close, because I, I went out and met with these people. Um, if you get taken in as, an, as a refugee in Indonesia, you get parked in a refugee camp for seven years, you're not allowed to work, you're not allowed to leave the camp, you're not allowed to do anything. I met a physician who is a pediatrician from Pakistan who's in this camp who cannot help the other refugees. She can't practice medicine on the other refugees in the camp. And that completely destroyed my brain. Because that's, that's, um, that's not really helping. Uh, so it's really important that the identity system needs to be, in my opinion, extra governmental and an overlay. It's my data. I should choose to give it to a specific entity that I trust, the World Food Program, the government of Indonesia. And I trust that entity to be the one that enrolls me, but not to hold my data. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah. Let, 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 let Elizabeth go on. Yeah. 
So the individual is always in control. It's about the individual. We are helping the individual to gain access to certain uh, services that they couldn't access without an identity. And that's how we view it. It's about this individual gaining something from this social contract that they're working within. Uh, we don't realize it, but almost everything that we do every day is a social contract. Uh, yeah. Elizabeth, you want to? Yeah, uh, well, I think you mentioned B2B to C. So I think this idea of selling products and services B2B that are then enhancing the B2C relationship. And so I think a lot of the business models are structured that way. Um, in terms of the laws, you know, and the approach there, so I think we need, if we're going to put the individual at the center, and if we're going to expect the individual to take on more responsibility in this, which is what we're asking them to do, we're asking them to manage these, you know, these technologies, we're understanding, asking them to understand what's happening uh, kind of under the hood, we're asking them to, to take on more responsibility, then in turn we need more protection. So we can't just say, you know, we're building these platforms, we've, we've got these products, we're not liable for anything now, it's all on the user. We can't say that because the user doesn't have their information asymmetries. There are imbalances of power. There's a lack of bargaining power. In order to counterbalance these, this, this individually managed, this self-sovereign approach, we need, to, we need to enhance individual rights. So things like the GDPR obviously are a really good start and we see laws around the world that are trying to mirror that in terms of data protection. Um, EIDAS is another interesting one, which is the European Identity Authentication and Trust Services Standard. That's really important in, in the cross-border interoperable context because what we know now is that people are more mobile. We change jobs, we change countries, we change contexts. Um, we can't have identities that are lim limited and, and siloed in that way. Um, so we need to build, so the reason the IDAS is particularly interesting is because it's about how do we accept uh, digital signatures and timestamps and other authentication mechanisms cross-border and in different contexts? How do we modernize them? How do we empower the individual who moves from one country to another or changes employers to still be themselves and to have those, the proof of that? Um, so I think all of the laws that are focused on consumer protection is another area that's um, really not uh, sufficiently focused on right now, but I think is increasingly important, is transparency has to become a huge piece of this because there is, again, there's that big information asymmetry there. And people don't understand really how these technologies work, and so they don't know what they're authorizing. So we can't have any kind of meaningful consent if they, they're not fully aware, which means we can't have the 100-page privacy policies. And lawyers have to take responsibility. We can't be enabling these bad business practices, right, that are obfuscating all this from the individual. So. Um, I think, I think there ha and I think that's why the legal profession is also more prominent now. I think this idea of legal engineers and policy engineers becoming part of the product design, part of this privacy and data protection by design and default, you know, before it wasn't perhaps as important, but now we really can't be arm's length from the tech. We have to be in there early building along with the engineers and, and those who are the developers who are writing the code um, and, and side by side. Um, and that's been our approach. And so I think, um, you know, there are path dependencies that are built into some of this tech that we can't undo. So if we're not part of the conversation early on, then there are serious concerns raised. Um, but I, I think that the, the individually focused, individual rights laws that are now, like I said, sort of um, graduating to the next level of the digital world are really important. Thank you. And I, before we go to, to Mike and next, and then um, to the back of the room, uh, I just want to say, you know, we, we, we're always encouraged to have a diverse panel, but a diverse panel does not just mean gender balance and racial diversity. We have an amazing lawyer, technologist, economic development professional, and I can't really <laughs> clearly define his description, but we have this incredible diversity of perspectives and expertise on this panel, which I'm so grateful for. So, to Micah. And then, and then over to Alan. Thank you so much, and thank you to all of you for the incredible insights today. I'm Tamika Tilleman with New America. As we have looked at these issues, we see immense potential, and that's why we spend a, a lot of, these, uh, t of time on these challenges, uh, just as Mike does. But the stumbling block that we keep getting tripped up on is the restoration of lost keys. Uh, and I know we've had a little bit of discussion about that today, but I'd love it if we could dig deeper, because ultimately, if you're going to have self-sovereign identity, you need some mechanism of restoring access to that identity if it is lost for whatever reason. And that seems to be a challenge for which nobody that we've encountered has developed a satisfying answer at this point, but hopefully one of you has, so we look forward to that. I'll, let's, I'll let's, just, take, let's, let's plow through it. Yeah, it's easy. There's, this is a known problem. There's a lot of research that's gone into it. In fact, some of it has been funded by Anil John, who's the head of um, identity and privacy 
portfolio at Department of Homeland Security, Science and Technology. Um, and I think within the next six months, we need to have some really focused work amongst all the people working on the problem to move it forward. I think the answer will end up being that I store shards of a recovery key with institutions that have a fiduciary duty to me. Brad, five minutes or less, preferably two minutes. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so a uh, couple of things that are critically important about this. Um, as all Ethereum wallets, we are a public-private key system. Okay? Giving the private key to <laughs> the individual is giving razor blades to a child. This is a horrible idea. So we make it very difficult for the user to get to their private key intentionally. The public key is a different story. The public key is not only on the ledger, but is many places. What's more important is how do I recover my identity, not just the key. Hmm. So there's a couple of examples that you know, are, are near and dear to my heart because they're absolutely the corner cases of, of biometry. Uh, there was a lady that is the non-Autar. She was in an automobile accident. She lost both of her hands, and she lost both of her eyes. So she's not a person as far as the Indian government is concerned. Okay? They didn't have a third backup mechanism. That's horrible. The other side of the coin is there's an immigrant that crossed the border into Greece, spent 25 years cooking Syrian food in Greece, and went back to Syria because he got deported by Greece because he didn't have a, any documentation. You're not supposed to be here. So we sent you back to Syria. He arrived back in Syria. He has no documentation there either. He's a non-person. He got deported from one country and accepted back into another country, but he can't do anything. Okay? So it's not so much the key pair that I need to recover. It's how do I recover my identity? Uh, inside of the Everest platform, your biometry is you. And we have the capacity to take all 10 of your fingerprints and your facial biometry. We currently have the corner case problem just like Audhar. If you're in a Deadpool style accident and everything gets burned off, what do you do? Okay. To Elizabeth's point, you need to have a governance model which allows for an individual to go to some oracle to be able to regain their identity. Inside of our system, it's a combination of three factors. You have to go through a whole series of knowledge unlocks. You have to go through a whole series of transaction unlocks. What were the last transactions you did that you know of? Okay, So temporal knowledge. And the third aspect is your PIN and password, the knowledge of your system. So that's how we do recovery inside of um, on Uport, they're figuring out that, I mean, they, they're at the cusp of figuring out the, the restoration of lost keys, and um, I think, you know, we do need to address this very quickly, very soon. But to Brad's point, I mean, we, there are, I have been in Malawi doing, um, you know, work around uh, mobile money acceptance, okay? And this was the big thing with international development and, um, you know, which kind of led me to the identity piece. But there are people where you're like, okay, four-digit PIN. They, they, you know, they're illiterate. They do not, they're like, I don't know when my birthday was. So when you at, say, just put in your birthday. You know, these are the things that, and then they go to the um, phone station. I'm just giving you some color yeah. to what we're dealing with in a lot of places. They go to charge their phones. They haven't noted which phone is theirs. And then they all come back. They get somebody else's phone, and they try and put in their PIN that they created a number against, and they don't. it doesn't go through because they have somebody else's phone. So th these are real things that a lot of communities are dealing with, and we have to design for that. The community attestations are amazing. I think that is a huge piece, but the governance um, and, and how do you recover your identity, um, having a transactional identity, something that you, and, and these different attestations, I mean, this is something we need to put a lot of thought behind. 
Yeah, so Evernim has the contract with the Department of Homeland Security to do this decentralized key management or DKMS um, pilot, which is, we're in the second phase of it now. It's one of the hardest problems to solve. Um, but without it, you can't have self-sovereign identity. And the problem is, if it's a fully hosted, I appreciate what Brad's saying about, you know, the user doesn't access their private key. But I think the problem with that approach is, you know, if you're familiar with, for example, Coinbase wallet, you don't own your cryptocurrency because you don't have access to those keys. So if you lose your Coinbase account or you're locked out of the service, you don't have your crypto anymore, right? So we're, we're worried about that because, again, to be truly self-sovereign, there has to be a degree of which you have full control over that and it's portable and all the things that we've talked about. But it's really hard. And that's why I think as the counterbalance to if we're going to push that to the user, there need to be enhanced protections for them and there needs to be extreme transparency. Uh, and so the thing that we're trying to do is build out, and I think Uport's been working on something similar as well around social recovery and there's you know, or a sharded approach, as Kalia mentioned, where you can kind of distribute pieces of your, a composite of your identity to, you know, different people that you might trust. They might be an institution like a bank or, you know, some other fiduciary, you know, your attorney, probably don't trust your attorney, but uh, <laughs> friends and family and different people and, and piece that together to kind of reconstruct who you are. And in some ways it's like it is in the real world now, you know, where if you lost your passport or your wallet or you have to kind of go through that process of that composite of reestablishing uh, the different pieces and, and achieving some kind of uh, coherent identity, but we're so far from it. And um, I, I think in the interim, we will see a lot of these kind of hosted solutions. And I think the risk is that if we accept those um, as, you know, enough and don't take it further, then again, we don't move past the status quo right now. We're, we're, we're not fully managing and not fully in control of our own identifiers. Um, Alan? Oh. Oh, thanks very much for a fascinating uh, panel. You know, when I look at this area, just an observation and then two questions. Uh, one of the things I feel would help people is if there was a much clearer delineation between what it was the kind of problem that you're trying to solve. And, I mean, th there's a whole set of discussions about getting uh, credentials under the user control, generally in pretty data-rich and credential-rich environments like this. Uh, and relying, as you said, on these various databases, some of which are public databases, government-issued databases. And that's a very different problem from the problem of trying to establish some kind of identity database in a system that is very credential poor. It may be rich in community attestation, but that doesn't necessarily help you in terms of a broader thing. These are very different kinds of problems, and I think it would be a good idea to... Um, and particularly if the emphasis is on the developing world, because I, I don't know where you start and where you begin. So the other thing is two questions. One is uh, the question of uniqueness. I mean, uniqueness is a very difficult thing. For many purposes, you don't need uniqueness. For transactional identity, you don't actually need uniqueness for most of it, right? But when you need uniqueness, it seems to me very difficult to reconcile that with the prospect that your data is under your own control. Because if I'm dealing with a biometric type system for uniqueness, my data by definition has to be available to check the identity of other people. And there's no way you can pretend that it's actually under my control for that kind of thing, right? Uh, they have to know my fingerprints, they have to be able to access them, they have to be able to access my face. I see that this is a question. So how is it possible to do a biometric deduplication and yet keep data under my control? That would be a question. Another question is the credentials. Um, when you're looking at the linkage to credential systems, how are you dealing with the updating of those credential systems? Is it a static or a dynamic updating? And I ask because, for example, I have a South African passport. And the value of a South African passport has gone up and down depending on the integrity of the home office, right? When they start screwing around and giving unauthorized passports, the value of my passport goes down. I then have to go for visas. This is historically what happens. So simply saying I have a passport doesn't really solve the question of whether at a particular time I really do have a valid passport or not. Just a few questions. On the last point about the management of exceptions, I think this is really important. We're doing some field work in India looking at the way in which different uh, states are using the system. And it's clear that where you have a very good human accountability mechanism for dealing with problems, you actually have a much less difficulties than where you don't. So you need a very clear accountability system for the technology 
failures or the people failures with the technology. So thanks very much. Thank you, Alan. Okay, who wants to? There were, there were, there were at least four questions there. And I, and I, and I want to point out that, I don't know if you'll permit me, Alan, I want to recast Alan's observation as a question. I think, I think these platforms do a, a, approach the developing world context very differently. And if we could just speak to that. Uh, anyone want to start? Well, I want to I wanna share um, why, why I was, um, so I think the technologies and the mathematics behind it are incredibly sophisticated, mm -hmm. and they allow you to do things that seem impossible, but are actually magic. So there are mathematical ways to establish uniqueness that um, do not involve having a giant database of everybody's fingerprints and biometrics. And we're just at the cusp of being able to bring those up at scale. And in <coughs> fact, iRespond establishes uniqueness without storing any of the actual biometric data. And that's, in fact, their value proposition is they take a biometric, they generate a 12-digit random number, and they throw away the actual data that created it. But they could recreate it if they wanted. To. Well, if if the person represent if the person shows up again, the same random number gets generated out of their biometric, and you can run it against the thing. I think this the the idea that the only way to do uniqueness is with a giant biometric database is false, and we actually need more research and more inquiry about how we solve this problem for the people who really need to solve it. And we don't have like the I can't give you the three word answer right here, but we need to. It's, it's possible, and we need to really push governments that are thinking the only way to do uniqueness is a giant biometrics database to rethink that assumption and to work with the technologists who are working on alternative ways to do it. So, uh, uh, Alan, do you want to? Yeah. We'll keep talking about yeah. it. Yeah. So, are very accurately in the encrypted space. You're talking about encrypting them, and as far as I know, since, the, since these are pattern recognitions and they're not exact, right, uh, the same fingerprint will not necessarily generate exactly the same random number. So I had thought that that technology was not sufficiently accurate for mass, and I don't know what you think, Brad, but can you compare your biometrics in encrypted space? So. It's an excellent question, and it's actually uh, called a Sybil attack. Okay, so Sybil attack is I want to create 75 different Facebook accounts to vote up a specific thing on Facebook. Well, I shouldn't be able to do that in the real world. I should only be me, okay? So inside of our system, one of the first steps that we do is we take your biometry. Uh, we take all 11 points of biometry, your 10 fingers, and your face, and we take that entire stack of 11 objects and we hash that, okay? Now I have a database that's anonymized of just hashes of 11 objects. And the first step at the next enrollment is I take those 11 objects, I hash them, and I compare them to the, to the Sybil database. Hey, is Sybil in there? No? Great, then you can be enrolled, okay? So we're actually scrubbing people on the enrollment side based upon this superset of their biometry. Okay. Um, the second component of when we're using biometry inside of the system, uh, it's a specific component of the biometry for a specific unlock. So if I'm walking up to get food aid, taking my facial biometry and me inputting my PIN, should be a sufficient check for me to receive this food aid. Going to Kalia's point of uniqueness in a mathematical space, that is what the, pri the public key is. It's a mathematically unique object. So by pairing this 11 object array of biometry with a public key, now I'm uniquely unique. I know those two things. And those two things being paired now I'm able to do a biometrically unique individual in the world. Now, iRespond has a 12-digit number. That's a little problematic in my world. 12 digits 
when you run that all out is about well, it's sub 500 million objects. Okay, I built my system for 20 billion objects. Why? Well, you know, right now we're at uh, two and a half billion people have been born and died on the planet up until 2000. Um, right now we're sitting on top of seven and a half billion people. So if I can't enroll everyone, I can't attack human trafficking. I can't attack these problems of cross-border migration. I can't attack these problems because I simply don't know. And that's unacceptable for me. I need to be able to enroll everybody. That's the only way you can do away with human trafficking, for example. And, and you're saying, I think Alan was asking, <coughs> those, that, those fingerprints and face scans, is the, the tech is at a point where you think it is creating a unique identity that is replicable? Yes. Okay. Um, in an array of 11 objects, yes. Okay, so then... If you're walking in with just a facial scan, yeah. that is insufficient. Okay, and then Shaley and Elizabeth, just to review, how good is your... And, and then you, I'll, I'll come back to you at the end, Brett. How good is your, what does is, what is your um, platform do in the developing world context where we have maybe people with no devices? The, the question about uniqueness and control, how do I, how, if I control all my data, how do you check that I'm me? So I think you spoke to that a bit about with the hash. Um, exception management and uh, dynamic credentials. Shaley, do you want to? I'll let her go first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's Talon's point. You know, when do you need this? I don't think we ask the question enough. What do we need uniqueness? There are a lot of situations where we don't. Again, if you go back to government services, the government really doesn't need to know that you're you. They need to know that you haven't accessed this particular public benefit or you haven't spent their money, right? It shouldn't matter that you're you. It shouldn't matter how old you are or anything like that. It just matters that you haven't double spent something that's been allocated on the public uh, as a, from public funds. Right? And that's where we get so fixated on an identity world. We talk about our data as a proxy for identity. We talk about privacy and we talk about our data. We don't talk about our privacy. So why should, for example, a particular government agency need to know that you're you to access healthcare services, right? They shouldn't. They just need to know that they have allocated sufficient funds and that, again, they haven't been double spent. So I think we often, we get really in the weeds with this stuff, but we don't step back and think when is important to be non-fungible and when, did, when does it not matter, right? When does it, you just need to be enrolled in school and it shouldn't matter what religion your parents are or you know, which district that you live in. So I think we approach it again through governance first. We approach it through the policy ends and the protections for the individual. And, and from, that, from that perspective, then you can talk about what's the best te technology solution to deploy. You don't start from the tech and say we've got really good biometric intake devices, right? <laughs> and we're going to deploy those because they're ready and then we'll figure out the rest. We start from what are we trying to achieve and then what's the best way to achieve that? And I think particularly in the developing world, we, we run the risk in this industry sometimes of experimenting on vulnerable populations and that's not okay, right? So we have to think about um, what, are the, what are the needs there, not from how can we deploy the solution quickly because here's a population that doesn't have any rights, so we're going to go ahead and just experiment on them. No, that's absolutely the wrong approach. It has to be there's a real need here. I love the, the title of the report. Is it Nail, Nail, finds, finds, a, Nail, hammer. Nail finds a Hammer. I mean, it's, it's brilliant because that's, that's exactly right. Um, that's what we all want, and I think that also is going to be the tipping point is when the Nail finds the Hammer, right? So there has to be, um, we have to, flip the sort of perspective that we're looking at this from and, and not start from the tech, but start from, from what we want to achieve and enable. And that's been our perspective. Yeah, I don't work for Uport. <laughs> I don't know much about Uport because I'm just starting um, to learn more. But um, I, uh, I mean, I agree completely that um, the, the, zero, the work around zero knowledge um, data stores and governance and, and kind of what is the minimum amount of information that we need to share in order to, for a transaction to take place? Is it, it's going to take, take a um, change in our mindset um, and, and the mindsets of large institutions who deliver those services. So there's a lot of work to be done there and I don't have a good answer for you. I, I just want to add one thing about um, the question around you know, encrypted data and encrypted search. We have um, an expert in the room here. You can talk to Ian later about um, 
new technologies to basically be able to search encrypted information and encrypted data. And that will be a huge breakthrough because that has been one of the challenges, one of the vulnerabilities is that in order for these systems to ingest those sorts of things, you have to expose the data. And so if we have that combination of zero knowledge capabilities plus encrypted search, then you open up a whole array of things where you can search these encrypted uh, biometric templates that, that have been hashed and not have to actually go and um, identify the individual. So um, there, there are some breakthroughs that are happening there. Tons of open questions. Let's, uh, Tim, do you have the mic? Let's go, let's bounce up. Let's take three questions. One, two, three, and uh, yeah. Hey, um, my name is Ashwata. I am a PhD student at American University. Uh, thanks, Mike, for bringing up the point about diversity earlier. I, I think a great addition to the panel might have been someone from a developing country who's working in development in the country, addition to identity folks. All respect to you all. Um, I have a set of questions uh, starting with, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, you said, uh, Brad, you said you work in uh, Indonesia providing liquid propane, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I missed your presentation earlier, so indulge me if you already talked about this. But if your solution is based on mobile phones and is your, if your solution is based on uh, mobile internet, and Indonesia has like less than 40% of mobile internet penetration, how does that, how, do you, how are you not helping further the digital divide? And who exactly are you serving? I mean, this is to everyone, not just Brad, my apologies. Um, and who exactly are you serving? Um, and if you're going to push the liability and the responsibility for securing the data onto these people who are just coming on the internet, how, how is education not a bit, how are you pr uh, promoting education of uh, you know, security, awareness, et cetera, among this population? And I also want to raise, uh, Kalia mentioned earlier to Brad about how, you know, uh, in the e ecosystem that Everest works in or EverID works in, uh, open source uh, uh, is not, you know, fundamentally important. Is that not undemocratic, especially if they're working in, in partnership with governments? And is it not necessary for developing countries to have, you know, <laughs> open source technology pushed by the government? And also to um, Elizabeth, uh, you mentioned GDPR. Um, I'm wondering how blockchain as like a fun, uh, as a source technology would fundamentally work if someone were to register, I mean, conduct transactions using Evernim and they wanted their, um, you know, transaction removed off the internet or off the blockchain, how would you do that? Let's keep taking questions. <laughs> Thank you, those are good ones. So this has been really fascinating and I appreciate all of you and your perspective, it's been great. My name's Amy, I'm with Cadasta Foundation and I, I wanted to take it back to the property rights piece again, um, Mike raised earlier. Um, so we work in property rights and one of the, and, and what, we're, what we were created to do was to try to um, help the one, over one billion people in the world who live without secure land tenure um, take matters into their own hands by giving them tools to map and document their own property rights, property and resource rights at the community level. And, and we, you know, that, that data is owned by them, we store it on our platform, et cetera. So there's a lot of parallels here about um, establishing, um, you know, a, a land identity or, you know, property rights identity using community attestations, using, you know, videos of people agreeing on boundaries or, um, using any kind of like payments or, you know, there's all kinds of documentation we can use in addition to geospatial data and all of that kind of stuff. So a lot of the issues around, you know, who owns the data, giving the date, you know, uh, allowing communities to control their own data on their own on property rights, et cetera. So we're dealing with a lot of same issues, including open versus commercial uh, uh, tools and platforms. So been dealing with a lot of the same issues. I guess one of my, one of the reasons I wanted to come here is because, you know, we're starting to think about, um, in addition to the issue around property rights and, and land ownership and community lands and for indigenous or individuals, it can be urban, rural, anywhere. Um, we're thinking about, you know, how, what, we are, in essence, establishing an identity for people who aren't documented in, in any major way. Many of them don't have identity. So is there a way that we can partner on this? What can we do together? Is it too soon for us to think about linking um, 
the, the community-based mapping process and documentation with, an, with the digital ID process. We're thinking about how to scale. We're thinking about, you know, how to work. We work B and B, but as you said, we're also, you know, B and B focused on on the consumer, on the customer, and what benefits the consumer and the customer. So um, we're think we're grappling with a lot of this in terms of scaling and also something that's sustainable, something that's you know a platform that's not going to go away five years from now because donor funding runs out or whatever. So all of these things, we we'd love to be able to do something. Um, around digital ID that links to us include and we're also interested in like addressing for people you know these addressing systems that are also trying to create mm -hmm. a, a, an identity for a location that doesn't have any you know there any any location anywhere so these are things that are floating around with us and I'd really um, love to continue the conversation but I guess the question is is it too soon for us to think about that? What could we do? Um, and then the issue of disincentive by governments. There are millions of government workers out there whose mm. worst nightmare is to not have to be the processor of the, it's same thing in land rights. The reason why yeah. CADASTA is, it even exists at all is because the government systems don't work for vulnerable people and the land registry systems don't work. And so by bringing these innovations and these disruptions, you know, how do we deal with that disincentive of getting, getting them on board? So before we take this third question, please, please. Um, I just want to, one of the introductory points we make in this is that one of the reasons we think self-sovereign identity is inevitable is as we've learned listening to this panel and hearing passionate debates about DIDs and biometry and private key recovery, this is complicated. It's really complicated, and Amy and her organization's incredible work on land rights. And it's unfair, in my opinion, sorry to pick on you, Amy, to ask Amy and her team to now become identity experts. Much as it's unfair to ask anyone out there doing whatever it is they do well, to now, identity in a digital age in a world of biometry has become so tricky that it actually makes sense we would see a Cadasta partner with a someone on this stage or other provider. In, in partnership to protect this precious issue of identity while doing the, the important work of Cadastra. So, so that was an awesome question. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, Kevin Barthel from Global Land Alliance. I, I'm really glad I went after Amy because it's a good segue to my question. Um, we work at a practical level trying to uh, uh, update or modernize land registries, property registries, and we feel that technology is already there. You know, you've got global uh, geographic referencing systems or addressing systems. You've got Web 3.0. You've got the blockchain, and now self-sovereign identity, which is super important to link the object and with the with the subject of the parts of the property rights registry. My my global question for probably more for Mike in New America is why do we even need a government-run land registry, mm -hmm. right? Okay, we have the technology, right? But then my specific question for the panel, and I want to hear how it addre is addressed with self-sovereign sovereign identity, is our biggest problem in land to try to move the land registry out of the government is that agencies, government agencies, have administrative processes that they resolve conflicts, or it goes to a court, okay? So if the government agency doesn't accept the information, or if the judge, the court, doesn't accept the information, it's not valid, okay? So the question for the panel is, how does self-sovereign identity, how are you being accepted? Because I heard the word adoption and I heard the word acceptance, and those are very important for our sector to figure out how governments and how courts are going to accept and uh, adopt self-sovereign identity. Thank you. Okay, so we're, we're technically at time, um, but <coughs> if the audience will indulge us, I'm going to let us just plow through answers to that. Yep. Um, start at the top. Brad. Bad Brad, you're exacerbating the digital vibe because you need phones, correct? Uh, not so much. Okay. Okay. So um, I spent 16 years working in mobile telephony. I, I built a bunch of the technologies that actually make your phones work. Um, inside of almost all of the developing world, uh, 2.5 and 3G is totally fine. 4G is coming quickly. And in many locations, 5G is actually being bandied about as a replacement for uh, uh, cable modems, for example, um, broadband access. Uh, so the mobile infrastructure in Indonesia is actually quite good. Um, 
the one of the things that the Indonesian government did in uh, 2002 was they created a system of uh, mobile phone agents. So even in rural towns, there is an individual who is appointed as the you know, phone booth for this town. And there is actually service in all of these little rural towns. Um, we don't require the user to possess technology. We require our partner's agent to possess technology. Most of our partners are in specific locations. Uh, for example, the TNP2K operates LPG depots in specific locations to distribute the liquid uh, propane gas. Uh, those regions are all uh, well covered by mobile. Thank you. Uh, and then there was a question, Kalia, about open source and, and democracies. Do you want to? Uh, yeah, I think those are really good questions, and you should keep asking them of people developing and deploying these technologies in the developing world. Critical questions. Can I answer Amy's question? Absolutely. I was going to go through them in order, but if you want to jump in. Well, yeah. So. Um, I think that there is enormous potential. One of the reasons I've been excited about these technologies is because it kind of it, it um, allows existing governments to do what they're already doing in a digitally native form, but it also allows new entrants into the credential market, right? So an indigenous community that's documenting its land also knows who is in its community, and they could pop up a server and issue verifiable credentials to the members of their community. Totally possible, super early, but you could totally do that within a year working with this community and the, the open, use the open standards and leverage open source code that different people are building so it's less expensive. You don't have to code it from scratch. Super experimental, but or totally possible. Or you could just possible. partner with one of these platforms. Yes, totally possible. Um, so, yeah, yeah, just to riff on Kylie, uh, Kylie, the who owns the data component of your question I thought was really interesting um, and is a difficult, uh, a difficult question to answer in many locations. Um, when you get to indigenous peoples inside of certain governmental areas, inside of certain governments, um, they are relegated to the margin. And they are uh, not inclusively accepted into the community. The uh, most significant thing you can do with a land title is associate it with a durable identity. Yep. Once you've done that, you can bank that land. You can create a relationship with another institution around that land. So having, uh, we have a partner that, that recorded 35% uh, of a country's land titles onto the blockchain before they came to us and said, yeah, we're, we've got all these land titles, but we have a couple of problems. Um, we're not really sure who owns the land, so the land you know, that we've recorded is all of these recordings aren't super valuable. And we were like, uh-huh. <laughs> because if you don't know, you know, if the government doesn't understand whose land it is and no one has recorded a change of title, you have a big problem. Um, real so close to home, New Orleans, in the 4th District, where did they store the land titles? In the basement of City Hall. Uh, what flooded during the hurricane? The basement of City Hall. So there are major tracts of land in the 4th District in New Orleans where nobody has an idea of who owns that land unless a bank holds the title transfer. That's it. That's the only thing. And if the bank was still holding that. So you have all of these properties where nobody, and this is in a first world country, nobody knows who actually owns this corner. Yeah, so we, we're, we're, we're going over time. I apologize Sorry. to the audience. Uh, I knew this would happen, so I should have been ready for it. Um, I'm going to give Shaylee 
and Elizabeth both a minute, and then I'm going to take a minute, and then I promise I'm going to stop this. Okay. So please go. So TurboTax was not invented by the government. It became so popular that government eventually adopted TurboTax, right? So let's think about that in terms of land registry. you got to get to scale, and then they'll just adopt. They're gonna, the courts will accept it, right? Um, so that's number one. Two, it's not too early to be, to be thinking about this, and I, I think we should all continue to have this conversation. Um, Consensus has a product called Tara, which is already looking into, ha has done some proofs of concept in India and in Southeast Asia around um, decentralized land property registries. And, um, and I think identity is, is a core component of that. And the, um, I think the last thing I wanted to say is around the developing countries and um, democracy and open source, I think it's essential for um, organic growth to take place out of these countries. We don't want Silicon Valley driven solutions like we saw in Web 2.0. We want things to take place at from bottom up, right? We want people to create the, uh, the solutions for their own problems wh where it makes sense for them. It's very user-centered design, and I'll just stop talking now. It's a shame. Thank you. I think that's why the open, open, open approach is so important, because what we need is we need these alternative registries, right? We need, for example, in the context of music rights, so um, a lot of um, American artists have basically uh, copyrighted traditional folk songs that belong to communities and to people that originally right, authored these works. And because they were locked out of these official registries and these systems and these ways for capturing these rights, um, we've, we've basically taken away things that are inherent to a community or to people. And we, don't, we see the same thing happening in the, in the real property context. So I think that the beauty of it, as Kalia mentioned, is these, these communities can now, if these things are open, they're open source, they're open standards, they're, they're openly, uh, they have open governance frameworks that are auditable and accessible, they can use the tools to build their own alternative sources and their, al their own alternative registries. And I think what we'll see is a convergence. We'll see kind of the existing sources of truth and the places that we you know, normally go to, the governments, the central banks, and we'll have, we'll have those credentials and those standards you know, that are, and where they're working, they'll continue to work. But then we'll see kind of this, this, this new, this organic growth, as Shaley mentioned, coming from sort of alternative sources, and we'll see them sort of converge. And the beauty of SSI and self-sovereign identity is that these composite, um, these, these permutations, these myriad opportunities to combine different sources to, to uh, contextualize an identity for a particular use case, for a particular purpose, and not have to have you know, an oversharing in every instance because it's the only mechanism that we have, or you know, a complete lack of trust because we don't have any mechanism for establishing that trust. So I think um, this multi-sourced, uh, you know, diverse approach is really critical. Um, and to the, you know, to the question about GDPR, uh, yesterday um, I've been part of this uh, blockchain observatory. The, the working group paper on GDPR and blockchain came out, so I can share the link with you. And, We'll probably answer a lot of the questions that you have there, uh, but it's a really important question. Three things. Please read my paper, newamerica.org FPR. That's number one. <laughs> number two, I, I love the last question. Why do we need government anymore? It's crazy. We have the tech. Let's just, get, let's just do this. Somewhat less provocatively, I would say government historically has done registries. And if we go back a century, there was one place with the resources and the people, the educated, who could manage this data. The tech is radically. With uh, a, uh, an external party saying yes, this this property words address is occupied by this person, and here's the imagery, right? So you talking about future So I think government does have to be different. The most important thing. 